Uh, I've got two titles for what I wanted to share. Uh, one title is uh, Get Your Hopes Up. Some people say, oh, don't get your hopes up. I'm saying, no, get your hopes up. Uh, or the other title is, if that doesn't work for you, let's try, uh, you can't win with a losing mind. You can't win if you've got a losing mind. And I want to take you to, to Mark chapter 10. Uh, and this is uh, Jesus bouncing off a, a conversation. And it says, uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. Pause. I think he might have paused uh, and let them, uh, oh. But then the segue that changes everything, but not with God which we heard tonight. But not with God. All things are possible with God. Some of us have been around church so long, we're no longer hearing that. That's amazing. So Jesus actually is putting two truths side by side. There's a lesser truth here. With man, this is impossible. That's true, but it's a lesser truth because there's a greater truth. And the greater truth is, Above this lesser truth of impossible with man, there's a greater truth. Once we bring God into the equation, that which was previously impossible now becomes possible. And so this just explodes in, in so many different directions that uh, we need to unpack. Some people have lived their entire lives on the wrong side of that statement. They've parked themselves on the lesser truth. You know, with man, this is impossible. And, and that's where they've lived their whole life. With, in fact, their way of explaining why they can't do something is to say, I'm only human. Well, try telling that to Jesus. You know, something that we have turn the volume far too much down on is Jesus lived an authentic, genuine human life. And what he was actually showing us was this is, I'm living and modelling for you a fully human life. Jesus wasn't cheating. He wasn't occasionally reaching into his divinity. That's why he could look at humans and say, follow me. Was he teasing us? He wasn't saying tag along and watch what I do. He was literally meaning follow me. Why? How could Jesus do all that he did and say to human beings? Because he knows you can do it. He knows that we're created in the likeness and image of God, that we're actually image bearers on the earth. And being human is not a limitation. It's a statement of incredible possibility. And once you bring that with God, you become fully alive, fully human. So Jesus wasn't doing the things he did to show us what God could do. No, he was doing the things he did to show us what we could do. Oh, you say, what, really? Oh, yes, he was emphatic about that. He's, he said, um, whoever believes in me, these works that I have done, you will do. Now, was he playing with us? Or was he actually saying, you're image bearers. You have an incredible capacity to display God. See, Jesus, in showing us God in humanity, did not feel limited because human beings are made in the likeness and image of God. There is no other creature on the earth that has the capacity to express God like we do. I'm not saying we are God. I'm saying that God has deliberately made you with an enormous capacity to express him. And Jesus in his humanity was showing us that. And we have perhaps downplayed too much of that. Listen to this. I'm jumping back to, to Romans chapter 8. The Son stands first in the line 
of humanity, he's restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives in him. Jesus wasn't doing the things he was doing to show us what God could do. He was doing the things he was doing to show us what we could do. Follow me. Follow me means literally do as I do. And uh, so again, Jesus wasn't, he was certainly an example to us, but he was also an example of us. That when you take this being that that by virtue of the fact of being an image bearer has an enormous ability and you add to that the God factor, well, that just takes it to a whole... That, that is us being fully human and fully alive. And so saying I'm only human is not a confession of limitation. It's, it's a confession of, of amazing uh, potential. When you think about it, let me just give you an illustration. You know, 100 and whatever, 20 years ago, we thought it was impossible to fly. It was like, what? But now what we once thought was impossible and beyond our abilities is an everyday occurrence. Because we discovered something. Listen, I want you to get this. We discovered something that was always there. It was always there. We just, it was our ignorance that denied us access to it. And once we discovered something that was always there, the law of the aerodynamics was there at the time of creation from the very beginning, but we lived without it because of our ignorance. Now an A380 can fly non-stop across the Pacific with 840 passengers and lady luggage. <laughs> See, some of you weren't going to be impressed until I added that part. So I thought, you throw that in there, you know. And lady luggage. Now you're impressed. And it can fly. But here's the thing. What else sitting here right now is available to us that if we knew it, it would create enormous difference to our lives. But we just aren't accessing uh, something that's not needing to happen, but is available to us with God is what's available to us. With God, this lesser truth is negated. That's the law of aerodynamics, isn't it? The law of aerodynamics doesn't uh, eradicate the law of gravity, it supersedes it. It's a greater truth above it. It's a law that operates above the law of gravity. And so um, what else is there sitting here that's available to us that we're ignorant of and we're not accessing it? There's a, there's a verse here. Again, we, this has become a fridge magnet. It's become a Karong poster. It's become, oh, that's nice. But listen to it. What is it telling us? This is amazing. It says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or even imagine, according, listen, here's the, here's the other bit, according to the power that works within us. So we've got God able to do exceedingly abundantly above according to the power that works within us. Let me tell you what I think the according to the power that works within us is. There is a scary miracle that Jesus did. I think it's one of the scariest miracles he ever did. He's walking along. This Roman centurion comes up to him in the street and says, my servant is at home uh, sick. And Jesus immediately offers to go to his home and pray for him. And the Roman soldier says, no, you don't have to do that. You can just stand here in the street and heal him. And Jesus goes, wow, I've never met anybody. But here is the da na 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 Because the guy could believe that, Jesus did it. So what we thought was God's chosen method of going to the home, putting his hand on the sick person, that was actually God just working with us. Okay, you need me to come to your home? Okay. But as soon as somebody turned up that believed all I need to do is, okay, I'll work with that too. 
What we thought was God jump, saying, no, you've got to jump through these hoops, is God going, I'm working with you. And the telling factor is what he said to this man. He said, according to your faith, be it unto you. According to your faith, be it unto you. He had standing in the street faith. So he didn't have come to my home faith. He had, so Jesus did it that way. You know, Jesus healed blind people and he healed them three different ways. One guy spit mud. Uh, the other guy prayed for twice. The other guy immediately sees. So I ask you, was Jesus showing off? Was he saying, I can do it this way. I can do it that way. Why? Why not just have a standard method? I'll tell you why. He was working with them. He was working with them. You know, one guy's thinking, you know, I, I was born blind. I mean, I reckon he's going to have to smear something on my eyes. So Jesus is going, okay, there you go, buddy. That's all I got available. But, you know, according to your faith, be it unto you. Another guy's saying, well, you know, He's going to have to pray for me at least twice. I mean, come on. Um, yeah, it's like, okay, twice. There you go. One guy can believe he receives. What we thought was God's method. So it's according to the power that works in you. God can do it exceedingly abundantly above according to the power that works within you. So I, I want to say, come on, get your hopes up. Get, lift. There's a scripture that talk, talks about when we lift up, when we're so fixated on the lesser truth, I love the fact that, that the Psalms exhort us to lift up our eyes. And what are you lifting up your eyes to see? The greater truth above the lesser truth. See, I also love the fact that God's not trying to minimise our truth. They're, you know, no, that's true. It just happens to be the lesser truth. <laughs> so, so now he's saying, come on, lift up your eyes. There's a greater truth over this lesser truth. Can you see it? You have to lift, stop being so fixated on the lesser truth. You know, years ago, we'd walk through the, the tents of the circus when it came to town and we'd see this ridiculous sight of a fully grown elephant believing it can't move. Here's a ridiculous sight. I mean, that elephant only has to hiccup and he pulls out that tent peg. But it, it's grown up and been conditioned to believe I can't move because of this tent peg. Well, what are some of the tent peg beliefs that are limiting you? With God, all things are possible according to the power that works within us. So I'm saying, come on, lift up your eyes, get your hopes up. Now listen, when the Bible talks about a hope, it's not talking about wishful thinking. The Bible word for hope is a confident expectation that God's invisible will will become visible. That that which is presently invisible in the spirit realm, in the will of God, will become, that's a hope. Your, your, a hope is seeing something that's presently unseen. Some people think they're using their faith to make something unreal become real. That's not true. Faith is making something unseen become seen. And so that's why Jesus taught you to pray. Pray this way. Father, your kingdom come. Your will be done where on earth. Now listen, as it is. Where is it now? It's there. But we're now praying. Come on, we, we need it to shift from there to there. While it's there, it's a hope. That's what the Bible word for what it is. It is the reality of God for your life, for your situation, uh, for your healing, for your whatever, but it exists in the unseen realm. We have a God that calls things that are not as though they were. He's talking about them, all right? And so the Bible talks about how we are to bring this hope your hope is so important. In fact, I'm going to tell you that your faith can't work without a hope. We make a big fuss over hope, uh, faith, but your faith needs a hope. If all you're seeing when you shut your eyes to pray is the back of your eyelids, you're struggling. Because you're only supposed to be shutting your eyes to see your hope. These eyes are shutting so that these eyes can open and I see the hope. I see the hope. 
Uh, people talk about blind faith. Oh no, faith isn't blind, it sees. And so Paul says, I walk by faith and not by sight. What's he talking about? I'm seeing my hope. I'm seeing this hope. And, and hope is being drawn into the realm of substance by faith. That's why when you're praying without a hope, you're like a fluttering bird with nowhere to land. You're like a car spinning its wheels that can't get a grip on the road. You've got to get a hope. That's why I'm saying, come on, get your hopes up. Don't just say, oh, I want to have a baby, blah, blah, blah. And the doctor said, I want to know which hip are you going to carry that baby on? The more you can crystallise that hope and see that hope and get it clear, the stronger your faith will come. Your faith will literally feel like a big hand reaching up and grabbing hold of that. Now I had to learn that we're not talking about wishful thinking. There's a difference. You try and make something up and you won't feel the same grip. Years ago, I've got a big family, I told you that, seven kids, and we sort of got to the point where we needed a new car. And uh, so I got it in my head that I wanted a Mercedes Benz. And I remember seeing a picture of it in the Time magazine, you know, one of those glossy, uh, you know, advertisements. And I found it. Oh, there it is. Tore it out, put it up, shut my eyes and saw a Tarago van. (laughs) I open my eyes, I look at the Mercedes Benz. Shut my eyes, a Tarago van. Open, shut, open, shut. Get behind me, devil. No, it wasn't the devil. It was dumb David making a... What the heck does a guy with seven kids want with a... You know, uh, yeah. God's going, listen, buddy, you need a Tarago van. That's the difference. What I'm trying to say is that's the difference between wishful thinking, something you're making up, Went to the auction. I'm looking for my Mercedes Benz big car auction. Looking around, and sure enough, there in the corner is a Tarago van. <laughs> I want to tell you what happened. We, we started, well, the bidding opened. I made my bid, and that was it. I just slammed down all that I had, which was $6,000. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, well, that's it. I'm done. Nobody moved. The, the, the auctioneer is begging. It's like they were all riveted and couldn't get their hands up. <laughs> I'm going, what? This is a good... <laughs> you know. Anyway, it got passed in below the reserve price and apparently that's a big deal and they have to... <laughs> okay, let him have it. So I got this awesome Tarago. That's called faith. That's called faith laying hold of the desire of God and pulling it into uh, the realm of substance. Here's what it says, Hebrews 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And by faith we understand that the worlds are framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen are not made from things visible. There it is. That's exactly, isn't it nice when what you've been saying is in the Bible? Yes. <laughs> All right. So faith is drawing uh, these invisible things into the realm of substance. Faith. Now hope, so here's the critical thing. Get your hopes up. Your hope is like a big magnet. You'll know when you've got a God hope, a God heart picture for what he wants. It's, it'll start pulling you like these guys start pulling you. It has this pull on it. Wishful thinking doesn't have that. You're, you're, you're the one trying to move towards it. Once you discover God's giving his heart picture to you, whoa. You feel the magnetism of it. It's pulling you towards it. And every time, you can't help but pray, believe. Uh, it's drawing you into it. It's, it's, it's so hope is such a critical part. But here's the thing. Your past also has a magnetism. Uh, 
And that's why the devil won't attack your faith. He'll attack your hope. He's attacking your hope. You know why? Because if he diminishes the magnification of that, pulling you forward, you'll start feeling another magnet kicking in. Once you become demagnetized with your hope, you'll start to feel another pull taken over and it's to go back to your past. There's people in this church that aren't here now and we watched them get saved. We saw, wow, this is amazing. And where are they? They're back where they were. And we think, what happened? They lost their hope. The devil came and attacked their hope, diminished that hope and another magnet took over and the magnet of their past began to pull them back to, to where they were. The spiritual attacks on our hope. I'm going to ask the singers and musicians to come back and help me. Look at this verse here. It says, I pray that God, the source of hope, isn't that beautiful? will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope. Hear what I'm saying, what hope is. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. I love what this verse is saying for everybody in this room, that he's the God of hope. That wherever you're at right now is, is not the end of the story. And that's why I'm saying, come on, get your hopes up. You, you, you might be stuck in a lesser truth right now in your situation with your health or your situation or your future and you're obsessing on what isn't. Stop looking where you don't want to go. Would you stop that? <laughs> Jesus is acknowledging, yep, you're right. On your own, that's impossible. But you're not on your own. You're not on your own. So come on, lift up your eyes.